we've had three great talks about things that either influence our everyday life enormously or that have huge potential to do so in the future. In fact, I'm going to talk about something that has influenced our everyday life and our human civilization for ages, and something that I personally find fascinating. I'm going to talk about the evolution of hybrid. Before I start with my talk, I'd like to walk you through a couple of concepts that you will find useful later in my presentation. First of all, what is a language and what is right? I find this distinction, this distinction very important since a language is only our almost biological system for communicating our abstract thoughts. While on the other hand, writing is just how we represent it graphically. And I insist on noting that it has the principles with which writing works have nothing to do with how our language works. And this talk is going to be about writing. To be honest, with a good writing system, you can write any language you want to, perhaps only with minor adjustments. I can give you the example that nowadays Polish, Turkish, Vietnamese or Italian are all written with the Latin alphabet, although they're not very related. Or even if I should take one really nice word to illustrate my example, take for instance my name. You can basically write it with any script you want to without changing its meaning. As I said, writing represents our language, and it basically has, let's say, the opportunity to represent two um, of the meanings or values that the language um, communicates. Let's now uh, go through a couple of useful words that I'm going to mention often in the presentation. First of all, take the word semantic. If you hear semantic, it's definitely related to the meaning of something. And take, for instance, this word, a tractor. The picture shows you how a tractor approximately looks like. It's a machine that fits weight in the field. And this picture gives you this information. It gives you the meaning of the word. However, it doesn't give you any clue how the word surrounds. And the phonetic value of the word is related to its sound. To take our example tractor and stick to it, it's basically composed by a pattern of phonetical particles. It's composed by two syllables, fract and tor. Syllable, important word, remember. It's also composed by a couple of consonants and by a couple of vowels. And those uh, particles represent the phonetic value of the word. Now let's move to the important question. Why I find writing so fascinating? I think it's one of the most spectacular inventions that our human civilization has given birth to. In fact, writing was so complicated and invented that it appeared on three birthplaces around the world, those being Mesopotamia, China a couple of millennia later, and Central America. On no other place did writing developed independently than all other places and cultures copied to some extent uh, writing from one of those three birthplaces. Now I walk you through uh, the example of Mesopotamia in more detail to show you how writing developed and evolved. If we take the Middle East, we usually know it as the cradle of civilization, since that was the place where some of the first complex urban societies originated. Writing, in itself, originated in a civilization known as Sumer, around 3500 uh, BC. Around the same time, people started writing in Egypt too, so there is some scientific debate if writing originated from both places independently or straight from Sumeria and Egypt. A good argument in this debate is that while there was a form of pictographic proto writing for thousands of years in the area of Sumer, it more or less occurs spontaneously in Egypt, which means that they probably saw it from somewhere else, but there is no debate, so let's leave it to that. As you can probably imagine very well, writing side with pictures, before seeing the pyramids. Uh, but now I'm going to give you an example from the following slides related to Sumerian writing and language. You have an object of everyday life, a fish, very common in everyday life. You want to write the word for a fish and you draw a fish. If you draw a fish a number of times, you start to simplify its graphic representation and you reach this symbol which was used to write fish in Sumeria. The same works with other objects of everyday life, such as a house, which also got simplified to represent this symbol approximately, or a person, um, this cat, for instance, which you, whom you first tried to draw. And <laughs> afterwards, <laughs> you figure, oh ah, well, let's simplify this even more, and you're ready. Yes. <laughs> you have one giant problem with this writing. 
you can write only things that you can see and you can touch. And those things, although they are the nice things in life, are not all words in language. So what do you do? Imagine a fairly obvious example. You have an arrow. You want to write an arrow. You draw an arrow in a very simplified way. But now imagine you have the verb to live. How do you draw? I mean, it's even a philosophically very complex idea up to this day. What does it mean and how do you draw light? The good part for the Sumerians is that in their language, the word for an arrow, pronounced as T, sounds familiar because it sounds fairly similar to the word for the verb to live, which is pronounced as till. So what they fear is, if I want to say that I live, I can draw an arrow and hope that people will understand what I mean. <laughs> and that's what they did. Uh, of course, how will people understand that? I mean that I live and that I don't mean an arrow. Sometimes context is sufficient, but in other occasions, uh, you need something else. And while this contribution to phonetic values is known as the Rebus principle, the Sumerians also introduced something called determinatives. Now I will explain to you how they work. As I already said, with a good writing system, you can write in any language. So I will decrease the usage of Sumerian right now. Let's take the modern English word tune. Tastes very well, you know how it looks like, and now we want to write it in Sumerian. You have to find other words that phonetically sound similar. So you take the word for a soup, which sounds like two, and you take the word for a stone, that sounds like that, and there you go. You've just written two now. The problem is, how do you figure it's, you mean, a fish? There, it goes to determinative. Uh, a certain symbol was uh, introduced to writing that wasn't pronounced. You didn't say how it sounds, it just reminded you what the person wanted to write. In this case, some sort of a fish. So you figure if it's a fish and sounds crossing it like that, so it's, it should be too now. Now let's take this even further and take names that aren't even like real words for objects in everyday life. Let's take a guy. Let's say that his name is Tishra. And now we want to write it. First of all, we want to split the name into syllables that represent other words that are objects of everyday life. So you can take the word for a house, that's A. You can also take the word or a symbol for a hand, you can recognize by the five fingers, which sounds like she, and you take water, that's A, Eshua. And that's how you approximately would write this name. To figure it's a name, you can attach a determinative for a person at the beginning. You don't pronounce it, you just know, oh, that's the guy's name. And now imagine that Yeshua wasn't a regular person. Imagine that his mother was a virgin. Then imagine that, uh, when in his with turkeys, he was caught by the police and executed, but resurrected soon after his death. <laughs> in this case, Yeshua would obviously not be a very ordinary guy. In this case, the determinant for a person doesn't do his job so well, so we can replace it with a symbol used for sky and also used to represent names of gods. And behold, you've just spelled out Jesus. As far as writing has become and was becoming increasingly phonetic through the development of civilization, what people figured was that why do we need semantic writing at all if we can represent everything as complex as Jesus with only phonetic writing? So, first of all, people experimented with something called a syllabary. A syllabary is a writing system that has one sign for every syllable in the language. But then they figured it was somehow too complicated and they scrapped it. Afterwards, uh, they figured you can represent not only syllables, but also single consonants or sometimes vowels, and develop what we nowadays call the alphabet. The, the principle of the alphabet was that certain civilizations or cultures in the region copied the symbols of other cultures to use them for increasingly small phonetic particles until, until they started using them as letters, as we use them nowadays. In general, some old Egyptian hieroglyphs were copied by some other guys and further simplified to be used as letters after a couple of centuries. And that's how Phoenician writing, about whose history we're going to talk about later, originated. Then some other guys figured, oh, they have an alphabet. Looks nice. I want it too. And copied those letters, rotated them a little bit, and that's how Greek developed with alphabet and gamma, gave the name of the alphabet as well. And at some point in time, some people literally liked those letters too. And there we go. That's how we write Latin nowadays. And if I 
really a really system knowing that that letter A actually represents a very simplified tag of a notice. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> to go back to the map, now look at the history. You have those civilizations. At some point in time, the Phoenicians copied Egyptian hieroglyphs to create the first alphabet. It was the first alphabet, so it was very not different. Other people wanted to copy it too. So it spread to their neighbors, the Arameans. Uh, and this writing more or less replaced Sumerian writing in the region. And it also spread uh, to their trading partners or enemies, the Greeks. The Greeks, of course, colonized some parts of Europe, such as Italy. So writing spread to Italy as well. How it can spread to other parts of the world um, is a fairly easy question to answer. Some people think that writing spreads because it's a better form than the writing before it, which is actually wrong. Writing spreads through conquest, dominant cultures, etc. So if we zoom out of the map a little bit more, we see that Aramean became the official language of the vast Persian Empire that we know from a couple of um, realistic modern movies such as 300, Alexander, the Prince of Persia, <laughs> etc. And it basically brought Aramean and ultimate writing into contact to places such as the Arab, the Indian subcontinent, where people started using it for writing Sanskrit. Or to Arabia, where the Arabic alphabet um, was given birth to. Greek and Latin, on the other hand, became the official languages of the vast Roman Empire. I know from a couple of other movies, I'm not going to go into them. <laughs> but they basically brought the Latin alphabet into Munich, let's say. Later on, like through the Middle Ages, with the spread of religion, it was Christianity. Latin was brought even to other continents, where it replaced uh, both Christianity and the Latin alphabet. Um, the cultures that were present at those places. And there we go. Basically, everyone writing an alphabet got it from there. Now, to move a little bit more shortly for the other places where writing originated, we will go to China. Um, as you're going to see, Chinese writing, which developed around 1200 BC, evolved in a very similar way. Basically, people started drawing pictures of things they see. You take a horse, you simplify it, and then you get a very, very much more simplified horse, which is the regular script used in China to this day. A notable fact is that this sign, which was devised about 2,000 years ago, is still in use today. Furthermore, how the rigorous principle of phonetic writing and the use of determinants developed were astonishingly similar. Take this side, for example. It gives you information on two things. The half in red means a female person. The half to the right is the very simplified picture of a horse that we saw from the previous slide. It's pronounced approximately as now. But my Chinese is not very good, so don't trust me too much. Generally, what this sign takes your information on are two things how it will sound, approximately like ma, and what it will mean, a female person. So, what is the word for a female person that sounds like ma? Well, it's the Chinese word for a mother, which also sounds approximately as ma. And that is how Chinese writing, uh, to, the, well, to the biggest extent, works up to the single day. Generally, as on the other places, Chinese writing spread to Chinese leaders, either through conquest, as we saw in some European examples, as it did spread to Vietnam at some point in time, or through religion, as it spread through Christianity, to Korea, where it spread through mostly through Buddhism, or to Japan, where it spread with the teachings of one Sir Confucius. Um, at the beginning, all those people started writing only in Chinese with Chinese characters. This can remind you of the medieval time in Europe, where everyone wrote in Latin with Latin letters. You didn't write in German, you didn't write in Irish, you just wrote Latin if you wanted to write. And that's how Chinese functioned in Eastern Asia for that time. Slowly, by time, people started developing their own scripts, such as the Japanic syllabary, which is also still in use to this day in combination with Chinese characters, where one symbol represents one syllable. Some centuries later, the Koreans developed an alphabet, and the king who devised it basically wanted to say in the previous of his book, Chinese writing is too hard, 
even a dumb person can learn an alphabet in a couple of days, so let's use it. But I mean, most of those people didn't use uh, those newly devised native scripts for a long period of time because the guys who needed to write, let's say rich guys, politicians, etc., they already knew how to write in Chinese. So a funny fact is that those phonetic scripts were first used by the less educated ones, which in that time were either lower class people or very often women that didn't have access to the education of the politician class. Of course, after some time, those scripts developed to gain more popularity, and while the use of Chinese characters in Vietnam faded away, since Europeans conquered Vietnam at some point, I'm going to introduce a Latin alphabet. The Korean alphabet and Japan auxiliary are still in use in those countries. A curious fact is that Chinese still uses this phonosemantic writing that we saw from examples as old as 5,000 years. A fair question is, why isn't it so primitive? And the answer is very easy to this one. The perfect explanation is that Chinese culture remained more or less intact for the last 2,000 years. So as I said, you don't look at writing because it's better. You've adopted through cultural change, through invasions, through other dominant cultures giving it to you. And China just didn't have that, so it's doing very well with its primitive script nowadays too. We can leave uh, we can leave it to that and talk about it more in the discussion afterwards. To show you mentioned the last place that we got a tribe, it's Mesoamerica. Um, it has also been a place with very old cultures that developed complex societies early in their history, where the first evidence of writing comes from the Olmec civilization about 900 BC. But writing reached its real heights in Central America through the Mayan script uh, that you probably know from various pictures or adventure movies or other guys who visited there. Unfortunately for the Mesoamericans and for the Mayans, at some point in time, a couple of kids with nice beards, big guns, and lots of diseases came over the ocean. And on the one hand, proactively exterminate most of the local population or spread bad diseases to it so most of the people there actually die. On the other part, they chased down everyone who had, um, let's say, my literature because that was pagan writing, it was bad for Jesus, and they burned most of those books, destroyed the monuments. So nowadays we have much less knowledge about. Central American writing than we do for, let's say, Chinese or European writing. Nevertheless, we have sufficient knowledge to say that they develop in a similar way. We can read Maya, for example, and Maya, as later stage, was a syllabic script, where one sign represented one syllable. Nevertheless, the Mesoamerican writing systems don't have a living heritage used in national language nowadays, so we might say that everything that remains to us are those two birthplaces, China and Mesopotamia. To summarize what um, I want to share with you as a message about this fascinating topic, um, we can say three things. First of all, writing originated in only three places around the world, which most people find hard to believe. Uh, but if you look closer to the letters we use in Thailand, Greece, Ireland, or Egypt nowadays, you would find some similarities if you dig deep enough. On the other hand, writing through its history as long as there was some development, inspired mostly by invasion, dominant cultures, etc., was driven from the direction of being very semantic. You draw what a word means, to being very phonetic. You draw the word in the way it sounds. And last but not least, what I already mentioned, since alphabetic writing first in history originated very early in a single place, now alphabetic writing in every country that uses this, such as India, Africa, Europe, etc., use a writing that originated from one single place. So even if you think that the Latin script divides you extremely from the barbaric, let's say, Arabic alphabet, well, they're very close to related to your work. <laughs> Generally, uh, what I want to transmit with all this uh, is how I started this talk. Writing is something that plays a huge role in our lives. Every day we read our messages, we check our emails, and we read street signs for the labels of products. Sometimes we even read books. So imagine how hard life would be without reading. You read a sign on a t-shirt, you read everything. So next time you do read something, remember that. Thank you.
so much. I was wondering is that the the writing about through copying basically a lot as well. I was just wondering why do we have some culture writing from left to right and some of it from right to left? Do you have any explanation for this? Or do you know is it about the perception of life or anything else? Have you ever yeah, you know, read uh, before I answer that, I will give the question that requires a very short answer. Do you have an explanation why you have most writing systems going from right to left? What, why do most writing systems go from right to left? It's, it's a, like a fairly easy answer nowadays. Um, you raise your hand. You're right handed. That's the one point, you're right handed. The other point is that we are exactly you're right handed, so uh, if you write with ink uh, and you write with your left hand, like this form of writing would actually be bad for the ink with which you're writing. And now imagine writing that goes, doesn't go away ink, but goes by carding things into stone or in wood. Um, like in many of those cases, it doesn't matter in which direction you write, even if you write with the right hand. Um, so I would say that um, the direction of writing, how it evolved, some like writing scripts go from up to the bottom or go like a snake in this way, mostly were dependent on the medium in which you wrote. And in many cases, it wasn't a problem to write in any direction you found um, free to write in. I was just wondering why which cultures or why some cultures stick to one of them and the other comes to the other. That's it is yeah. the medium in which you're That's a topic right. for the next, for another program. <laughs> <laughs> I should okay. think of it. Are there more questions? And if here in, uh, here in question, in the fourth row? Right, you know, <laughs> there's more to Okay, uh, microphone. And then it's all worth something in the back. So my question is basically what's about the city out of the best Greek family of writing that come from the Chinese well, um, The thing is, every alphabet in writing comes from a Phoenician alphabet outside of East Asia. So to give you like one which crash course in the Syrian right. alphabet, um, scripts spread by three ways. It was either, uh, let's say, a very basic copying. Oh, those writers writing exactly the same way with the same letters. It was sort of copy when you say, oh, those have letters, let's take them, but use them in another way. Or it was only um, ideological diffusion. Oh, those people write, so let's write to devise our own script. So in the case of the Cyrillic alphabet, uh, for political reasons, um, two Greek monks that wanted to spread Christianity to the Slavic pagan population, devised an alphabet in which to translate the Bible into the Slavic language. So it was um, they basically used the form of those Greek letters, introduced a couple of new ones, but it was a political decision with two scholars um, devising the script. So it was inspired by the Greek writing very directly. And let's say a slide A is the Greek A. And most of the letters, that's true as well. Thank you. I think there is one in the back, the Greek t shirt. Thank you very much for your talk, gentlemen. And um, what about um, writing, language writing development nowadays, when conquering new territories is the most popular area? Mm -hmm. I didn't really understand your question, sorry. Do languages, do writing of the languages develop nowadays? Is there any way of, I mean, in particular, any kind of, I mean, other languages will develop their its writing in that or another way? Well, it, um, it does, and I would say that the reasons nowadays are much more political and internal. And I can give you the first example uh, I want to mention is writing in Turkey. Basically, only 100 years ago, there are some people still alive from this time, and Turkey wrote with a little bit modified Arabic script. And the politician came saying that oh, Arabic script is too barbaric, let's use Latin letters, and he basically changed it from, like, from, from the top. Down, which was a purely political decision by people who were doing fine in our Arabic alphabet too. Another development that happens is to, uh, to take the example of many former countries, let's say in the Soviet Union. Like many of them used to have a Cyrillic, like original Islamic alphabet used for unrelated languages, but in order to say, oh, we're not part of the Cyrillic anymore, they're replacing their alphabet with Latin letters nowadays. Although both were 
exactly as well. So I would say writing still develops nowadays, but it's mostly political decisions replacing letters related to one heritage to letters related to a hopefully forgotten heritage. Thank you. I think we will have to stop questions right now, but there is more time to ask questions after the talk. Let's thank you, one and uh, happy birthday again. Thank you.